There's just one thing I'd like mighty well to see again before I die, Granny Tollett said. And that's a good old-fashioned county fair. The Apostle Paul says we must press forward, forgetting about the things that are behind. But there's just some things that I left behind that I can never forget. And the fairs that we had in my day was one of them. It was the quietest hour of an August afternoon. And Granny Tollett and I were sitting on the back porch, shelling butter beans for the next day's farmer's market. Before us laid the garden in its splendid fullness of late summer. Concord grapes loaded the vines of the old riggedy fence. Tomatoes were ripening in reckless plenty, sure to be given away to the neighbors, or to lie in rows on the windowsill in the kitchen, or the shelves of the back porch. And the second planting of the cucumber vines ran in flowery luxury all over the outer row of the garden, and even encroached on the territory of the squash and the melons. Damsons hung purpling over the eaves of the house, and wasps and bees kept with a lively buzzing as they feasted on the windfalls of the old yellow peach tree near the garden gate. Nature had distributed her sunshine and showers with wise generosity that year, and neither in field nor in garden was there lack of any good thing. Perhaps it was this gracious abundance and the thought of the upcoming fair that had turned Granny Tollett's thoughts towards the fairs of her youth. Folks nowadays don't seem to think much about fairs, but when I was young, a fair was something that grown folks looked forward to, just like the children did at Christmas. The women and the men, too, was getting ready for a fair all year round, with the women a-piece in quilts and knitting socks and weaving carpets and putting up preserves and pickles, and the men raising fine stock. And when the fair was to come, it was worth going to, child, and worth remembering after you'd gone to one. I hear folks talking about the fair every year, and I laugh to myself. You folks don't even know what a fair is. And I sit out there on my porch during fair week, and I watch those buggies and wagons going by in the morning and coming home at night, and I get right happy. Thinking about the time when me and your papa Coy and the children used to go over that same road to the fair. But child, it was a mighty different sort of fair from what they have nowadays. One thing is, honey, they have fairs too soon. It never was intended for folks to go to fairs in hot weather. And here they are having them in the first week during September, about the hottest, driest, dustiest time of the whole year. And nothing looks pretty then. And it always makes me think of the folks when they've been wearing their summer clothes for about three months and everything's all faded and dusty and drab. That's the way it generally is in September. But just wait two or three more good rains come and everything's washed clean and sweet. And the trees look like they get a new set of leaves. And the grass comes out green and fresh like it does in the spring. And the nights and the mornings feel cool. Although it's plenty hot enough in the middle of the day. And maybe they'll come just a touch of early frost. Just enough to turn the top leaves on the sugar maples. That's October, child. And that's the time for a fair. Lord, Lord, the good times I seen in them days. Starting early and coming home late. With the sun setting in front of you and by and by the moon coming up behind you, and the baby fast asleep in my arms, and all the other children talking about what they've seen, and your papa Coy driving slow over the rough places, and looking back every once in a while to see if we was all still there. I liked fairs as well as anybody, and I reckon I saw all there was to be seen, and heard everything there was to be heard every time I went to one. But now, when I get to calling them up, it appears to me that the best part of all, the part that I recollect the plainest, was just going there and coming back home. Your Papa Coy knew I'd like to stay until everything was over, and he'd get somebody to water and feed the stock, and then I didn't have to cook any hot suppers as long as the fair lasted, so there wasn't any reason to hurry me or your Papa. I recollect Mary Petty came up one day about five o'clock, just as we was looking at the last race, and she said, I'm about to drop. I believe I'd rather stay here and sleep on the floor of the amphitheater than to go home and have to cook a hot supper. And I said, well, don't cook a hot supper then. And then she said, why, well, Silas won't eat a cold piece of cornbread at home to save his life or mine either. There's a heap of women to be pitied, child, said Granny, dropping a handful of shelled beans into my pan with a cheerful smile. But of all things, I tell you, deliver me from living with a man that has to have hot bread three times a day. Miley Amos used to say that when she died, she wanted a hot biscuit carved on her tombstone. Because if it wasn't for hot biscuits, 
there'd be a mighty small crop of widowers. Sam, you see, was another man that couldn't eat cold bread. But Sam had every right to his hot biscuits. For if Millie didn't feel like going into the kitchen, Sam would go out and mix his own biscuits and bake them himself. Sam's soda biscuits was as good as mine. And when it come to mixing biscuits, why nobody could equal Sam. Millie would make the dough just as stiff as she could handle it. And Sam would mix it until it was soft enough to roll out. And such biscuits I never saw again. Just as white and light as snow inside. And crisp as a cracker outside. Folks nowadays make their biscuits by machinery. And I tell you, they don't taste nothing like the old-fashioned kind that was made by hand. And talking of biscuits, child, that reminds me of the cooking I used to do for fairs. I don't reckon many women likes to remember the cooking they've done. When folks get to remembering, it looks like the only thing they want to call up is the pleasure they had. The picnics and the weddings and the tea parties. But somehow, the work I've done in my day is just as precious to me as the play I've done. I hear young folks all the time a complaining about having to work so hard. And I say to them, child, when you get to be as old as I am and can't work all you want to, you'll know there ain't any pleasure like good hard work. That's one thing that bothers me, child. Just then, Granny Tollett's voice sank to a confidential key. I've had plenty of fears in my life, but they've all passed me over. But now there's just one thing that I'm afraid of, that I'll live to be too old to work. It appears to me that I could stand just about anything but that. And if the time ever comes that I can't help myself or help the other folks I love, I trust the Lord will see fit to call me home and give me a new body and start me to working right away again. Hey guys, JD here. Click the link below to check out my new book. It's full of stories just like the one you're listening to right now. Now, back to the story. But anyways, as I was saying, I've always enjoyed cooking. And it's a pleasure to me to sit and think about all the hams I've boiled and the old-fashioned pound cake and the sponge cake. Your Papa Coy was always mighty proud of my cooking. And we generally had a half dozen or more of town folks that eat dinner with us every day of the fair. Old Judge Grace and Dr. Bingham, they never failed to eat with us. The first year, my bread took the prize at the fair. Your Papa sent that winning loaf to the judge with a blue ribbon tied around it. Now, after Papa Coy died, I stopped going to the fairs. And I don't know how many years it's been since I set foot on those grounds. And I hadn't had an idea how things had changed until the year before last, when Sally Ann and her husband came down from Johnson City. He'd come to show some of his stock, but she had come along with him just to see me. And she said, Granny, you've got to go to the fair with me one day. Well, anyhow, I went more just to please her than to please myself. Well, I'm always contending, child, that this world's growing better and better all the time. But Lord, Lord, that fair came pretty near upset my faith. Why, in my day, folks could take their children to a fair and turn them loose. And if they had sense enough to keep from underneath the horse's feet, they were just as safe at the fair as they was at a family get-together. But Lord, the sights I saw that day that Sally Ann took me to the fair. Every which way you look, there was some sort of trap for tempting boys and leading them astray. Whiskey and beer and all sorts of gambling machines and pool selling. And little boys no higher than that, smoking little white cigarettes and offering to bet with each other on the races. And I said to Sally Ann, Child, I don't call this no fair, while it's nothing but a gambling den and a whiskey saloon. And now I know what old Uncle Henry Matthews meant. I asked old man if he was going to show anything at the fair that year, and he said, No, ma'am, unless you've got something for the town folks to bet on. It ain't worthwhile. But there was one thing that I did enjoy that day, and it was the races. There's some folks that thinks racing horses is a terrible sin, but I don't. It's the betting and the swearing that goes along with the racing. That's the sin. If folks behave just as well as the horses behaved, a race would be just as religious as a Sunday school picnic. There ain't a finer sight to me than true-blooded horses running around a smooth track. And the sun is shining and the flags are waving and the wind a-blowing and the folks a-cheering and hollering. So when Sally Ann said the races were about to begin, I said, come on, child, take hold of my arm and help me down these steps. I'm going to see one more race before I die. And Sally Ann helped me down, and we went over to the grandstand and got a good seat where I could see them horses when they come across the finish. I tell you, honey, it made me feel young again just to see them horses covering ground like they did. My father used to raise fine horses, and your Papa Coy used to say that when it came to knowing a horse's good points, he'd back me against any man in Kentucky. 
I'll have to be a heap older than I am now before I see the day that I wouldn't turn around and walk a good piece just to look at a fine horse. Just then, Granny Tollett gave a laugh at this confession of weakness. It was like the old times to see them horses run. And when they'd come to the finish, I was laughing and hollering as much as anybody. Just then, there was a sound of galloping hoofs on the gravel road and loud woes from the driver in distress. We started up with the eagerness of those whose lives have flowed too long in the channel of stillness and peace. Here was a possibility of adventure, not to be lost for any consideration. Granny Tollett dropped her pan with a sharp clang, and I quickly trailed behind her. There was a solitary horseman who was at the mercy of his steed, a mischievous young horse that had never felt the bridle in the bit of a trainer. Oh, that's Joe Crawford's red-headed boy, chuckled Granny Tollett. Nobody would ever think he was born in Tennessee, now would they? Old man Bob Crawford used to say that every country boy in this state was sort of a half-brother to a horse, but that boy yonder ain't no kin to a filly that he's trying to ride. And I tell you, there's good blood in that filly just as sure as you're born. I can tell by the way she throws her head and she uses her feet. She'll make a fine saddle mare. If her master ever gets hold of her, just look yonder, will you? The horse had come to a stand, and she gave a sudden backward leap, raised herself on her hind legs, and came down on all fours with a great clatter of hoofs, and began a circular dance over the smooth road. Round she went, stepping as daintily as a maiden at a mayday dance, while the rider clung to the reins, dug his bare heels into the glossy sides of his steed, and yelled, Whoa! as if his salvation lay in that word. Then, just as awkward as a sense of duty, the filly ceased her annex, tossed her head with a determined air, and broke into a brisk, clean gallop that would have delighted any skilled rider. But it seemed to bring only fresh dismay to the soul of Joe Crofton's boy. His arms flapped dismally and hopelessly up and down. A gust of wind seized his old ragged cap and tossed it into one of the nearby azalea bushes. His protesting woes voiced the hopelessness of one who resigns himself to the power of a dire fate, and he disappeared ingloriously into a cloud of summer dust, whereupon we returned to the work of bean shelling, with the feeling of those who'd watched the curtain go down on the last scene of a comedy. I declare to goodness, sighed Granny Tollett breathlessly, as she stooped to recover her pan. I ain't laughed so much and I don't know when. That reminds me of the time Sam Amos rode in the tournament. And she began laughing again at some recollection, which I didn't know. Now that's right curious, ain't it? When I'm sitting here talking about fairs, and that boy comes along and makes me think about how Sam rode at the fair that year they had the tournament. And I tell you, I don't know how long it's been since I thought of that ride. And maybe I never would have again if that boy of Joe Crawford's had to put me in the mind of it. I dropped my butter beans for a moment and assumed a listening attitude. For, even as a young boy, I knew to pay close attention when a master storyteller was speaking. You see, the town folks are always getting up something new for the fair. And that year I'm talking about, it was a tournament. All the Anderson County folks that went to town during the last county court day before the fair came back with the news that there was going to be a tournament the third day of the fair. Everybody was a saying, what's that? And nobody could answer until Sam Crawford went to town one Saturday just before the fair and he come back with the whole thing laying at his tongue's end. Sam heard that they was practicing for the tournament that evening, and as he passed the fairgrounds on his way home, he made it a point to going in and seeing what it was all about. He said there was 12 young men, and they were called knights, and they had a lot of iron rings hung from posts all over the amphitheater, and they'd tear around that ring like mad, trying to stick a pole through every ring and carry it off with them. And the one that got the most rings got a blue ribbon, Sam said it took a good eye and a steady aim and a good seat to manage the thing, and he enjoyed watching it, but he wondered why they called the thing a tournament. Well, anyways, finally the third day of the fair came, and we was all on hand to see the tournament, and he went off just like Sam said. There was twelve knights, all dressed in black velvet and gold and silver spangles, and they galloped around and tried to take the rings off with their long poles, and when they got through with that, all the knights rode up to the judges with a wreath of flowers on the end of their poles, and every knight called out the name of the lady that he thought the most of, and she came up to the stand, and they'd put a wreath on her head, and there they were, twelve pretty gals with flowers on their heads, and they were called the queens of the county fair, 
and it was a mighty pretty sight, I tell you. The band was playing Tennessee waltz, and everybody was hollering and throwing their hats. Then the knights galloped around the ring once and went out the big gate, and then they came up and promenaded around the amphitheater with the girls that they had crowned. The knight that got the blue ribbon took off ten rings out of fifteen, and he rode a mighty fine horse. And then Sam Amy said, I believe in my soul. If I'd have been on that horse, I could have took off every one of those rings. Now, Sam was a mighty good rider, and Millie used to say that the only thing that would make Sam enjoy riding more was if somebody would have put up a looking glass so he could see himself riding along the road. Well, the next thing on the program was a gentleman's rider's ring, and the prize was $5 in gold for the best gentleman rider. We were waiting on that to commence when Uncle Jim Matthews come up, and he said, Sam, there's only one entry in the ring. This thing's about to fall through. You see, they had made a rule that year that there shouldn't be any prizes given unless there was some competition. And Uncle Jim said, There's a fella from over in Roan County that's mighty anxious to ride. He come all the way up here on purpose to get that prize. Suppose you go out there and ride against him and show him that Roan can't beat Anderson. Sam laughed like he was mighty pleased and he said, Well, I don't care one bit about that prize, Uncle Jim. But just to oblige the man from Roan County, I'll ride. But I wish I'd have known it this morning so I could have put on my Sunday clothes. And Uncle Jim said, Never mind that. Just sit on your horse straight and carry yourself so. And the judges won't look at your clothes. Well, how about the horse? Why, there's a dozen or more good-looking saddle horses out yonder, right outside the big gate, and you can have your pick. So Sam started off, and the next thing, him and the man from Roan County was trotting around the ring. Us Anderson County folks had kind of kept together when we sat down in the amphitheater. Every time Sam would go past us, we'd all holler for him. The Roan County man appeared to have a lot of friends on the other side, and they'd holler for him too. I would say the place was divided up about even. Now, both of the men rode mighty well. They put their horses through all the paces, racking and pacing and loping, and it looked like it was going to be a tie when all at once the band struck up Dixie and Sam's horse broke into a gallop. Now, Sam didn't mind it. He just pushed down his hat on his head and took a firm seat. And he seemed to enjoy it just as much as anybody. But after he galloped around that ring two or three times, he tried to rein the horse in and get him to calm down to a nice steady trot like the Roan County man was doing. But no, sir, that horse didn't have any idea of stopping. The harder the band played, the faster he galloped. And old Uncle Jim Matthews said, I reckon Sam's horse thinks it's another tournament. And your Papa Coy said, It looks to me like that horse has been paid to gallop. Don't he, Uncle Jim? But horses have a heap of sense, child. And it looked to me like the horse knew that he had Sam Amos, one of the best riders in the county, on his back, and he was just playing a little joke on him. Well, of course the judge has seen that Sam had lost control of his horse, and they called the Rowan County man up and tied the blue ribbon on him. And he took off his hat and waved it around and trotted around the ring. And all the folks from Roan County hollered and threw up their hats. And all that time, Sam's horse was tearing around that ring just as hard as he could. Sam's hat had blown off, and I recollect just how his hair looked, blowing back in the wind. Millie hadn't trimmed it in some time, and he was getting madder and madder by the minute. Of course, all us Anderson County folks was mad too, because Sam didn't get the blue ribbon. But we had to laugh. And all those Knoxville folks and those Roan County folks, they looked like they had split their sides. Old man Bob Crawford just laid back on the benches and hollered and laughed until he got right purple in the face. And he said, this sure beats the Kittle Creek baptizing all to pieces. Well, nobody knows how long that horse would have kept on galloping because Sam couldn't stop him. But finally, two of the judges stepped out and they headed him off and took hold of the bridle and led him out of the ring. And Uncle Jim Matthews jumped up and said, Lord, let me out of here. I just want to see Sam when he gets off that horse. Now, Millie was sitting on the top seat, considerably higher than I was, and she said, I wouldn't care if I didn't see Sam for a whole week, because even though Sam don't get mad often, when he does, folks better just keep out of his way. Well, Uncle Jim just started off, and the rest of us sat there and waited. And pretty soon, here comes Sam, looking mad enough to fight all of creation. Everybody was still laughing until up came old man Bob Crawford with about two yards of blue ribbon. He jumped over into the ring and got it from the judges as soon as he could quit laughing. And he said, Sam, 
I've seen more graceful riders and riders that have had more control over their horses. But I ain't never seen a man yet that stuck on a horse more faithful than you did in that little tournament of yours just now. And I'm going to tie this ribbon on you just for sticking on when you might just as easily have fell off. And that's how Sam Amos rode in the tournament, said Granny Tollett conclusively, as she rose from her chair and shook a lap full of bean pots into a willow basket nearby. Granny, is Sam Amos still living? I asked, in the hopes of prolonging her tale. Just then, a softened look came over Granny Tollett's face. No, child, she said quietly. Sam's oldest son is still living, and he has three daughters. But they all moved out of East Tennessee long ago. But old man Sam, he's been in his grave for 20 years or more. And here I was, sitting here laughing about that ride of his. Somehow or another, I've outlived nearly all of them. And now and then, when I get to thinking about the old times, seems like no matter where I start out, it seems like I always end up talking about the folks over yonder in the old burying ground. Just then, she smiled brightly. But don't you worry, J.D. There's plenty more stories to be told over on the other side, too. Music